license and registration, he can sense your aggravation. The head of the fallen angel. The world is muttering the under the, the floorboards. Stomp even louder. On time. Let them know you are alive today. Or unhum. Did you know that your hands came with a ripple effect? Whisper tones unraveling like silk. Blood, sweat, and tears win by any means, poetry. Sway, look at me. Is a piece of the pie too good for me? Some may call it brought the mic. We call it poetry. You don't know it, but you can climb heights greater than any conquered by my generation. You gaze into the eyes of possibility, waiting for her to pronounce words of proclamation, some magical formula of success, sometime playing the game of wait and see, while at others boldly speaking your truth through this elusive game called freedom. If only you knew how real it could be. If only you would reel in your senses, stop straddling fences long enough to make a conscious choice to be conscious. Stop sleepwalking through daydreams long enough to conquer nightmares. Of course it's hard. Freedom has its reward, but you've got to earn it. Gotta work up some sweat till it pours from your veins. Put your brawn and brain into high gear. Push into overdrive sometime. Yours could be the voice that carries not just a message, but the message to bring light to a dark place, to bring peace to a tormented nation. Because truth be told, whether spoken to young or old, freedom will always strengthen and empower. And in that final hour, when decisions made will either make or break the situation, yours could be the voice that makes things right. No matter what you fear the odds will be, remember the road from possibility to reality is as long or as short as you make it. Well, hello, hello, and welcome back to many for Sojourn with Words. And to our new viewers, welcome. Join the family right here on CTV as we present some of the best poets and poetry you will ever find. We are very happy today to have with us Julian Matthews, who is joining us from Malaysia. And Julian, first and foremost, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's my privilege and honor. I want to make sure that our guests are aware that you are a poet of some renown. We have Julian. Well, let me just share some of his bio information. And, and then we'll, of course, be talking directly with him. But Julian Matthews is a mixed race poet from Malaysia. He was nominated for the Pushcart Prize by Dreamcatcher magazine, Stairwell Books, in 2022. He is published in the American Journal of Poetry, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Lothor, and I'm going to get this wrong, Lothlorian Poetry Journal, Live Encounters and New Verse News, among other journals and anthologies. Now, Julian is a former journalist for the Star of Malaysia and correspondent for Nik Nikki, I don't know if it's Nikki or Nikai Business Publications, CNET, and News Bites, Washington Post, Newsweek, USA. He is also a media trainer for C level executives. That's letter C level executives. He says he stumbled onto poetry by accident in 2017 at a creative writing workshop. That happy accident 
has turned into a rabid compulsion. He is still extricating himself from the crash. Julian, welcome, welcome, welcome. We now get to hear from our guest poet directly. First of all, Julian, I've had the privilege on numerous occasions to hear your wonderful poetry, and you are a word master. How did you find poetry? Or would it be fair to say, how did poetry find you? Yeah, I think the latter is more accurate. I wasn't planning to be a poet. I was a journalist and a media trainer dealing mostly with facts. I I enjoyed listening to spoken word poetry on YouTube every now as it as entertainment, and I was moved in twenty seventeen by attending a memorial for the victims and family of MH370, the plane that went missing in 2014. And it had been three years, and the plane that was still not found, although pieces of it had started, started to uh, appear on the African coast. I wrote a piece. I didn't even think of it as poetry and posted it on Facebook. A friend of mine uh, pointed out to me that that's poetry, and you're coming for a reading, and you're going to read your poem. And that's how my, my interest in poetry started. You were instructed. Okay. Okay. Well, it is oftentimes the case when poignant and, and very heartrending experiences occur and persons write about it, it, it allows others to, to have an experience that otherwise they would not have that fuller, under that richer understanding. So thank you for being one who captures, and, and I've heard, as I said earlier, I've heard your words, your works, so I'm not at all surprised. I see also in, in some of your information that one of the poets you highlight is Saul Williams, a, a phenomenal poet that, of course, tell me, how is it that, what is it that makes the poet stand out for you when you're looking or listening to poetry? Yeah, I saw him first on Deaf Poetry, I think it's called. And, uh, yeah, and it was so mesmerizing, his performance. He had a, a long piece of paper in front of him where he's reading this poem that he's a, associated with, it, his signature poem, I can't remember now which one. And uh, at one point he just dropped the paper and just started speaking off the cuff and it was such a brilliant performance I thought because I'd never seen poetry in that form before I'd always see it as something so staid and straightforward and Shakespearean and somebody standing in front and reciting poetry this wasn't a recital it was a performance yeah it was, yeah freestyle yeah freestyle off the dome absolutely and, and it's, he is certainly a, a master of such yes Saul Williams and and now, when you talk about poetry that you would like to see and hear, are there parts of the world where you find poets are more akin to your style or your liking? Uh, I, I know you're from Malaysia, so that's going to be a totally different audience than here in the States. But talk to us about perhaps your experiences with poets from around the world. When COVID happened, uh... Zoom was a godsend because then people like me, just newbie poets, could stretch ourselves and enter spaces that we could never afford to go to, except through invitation or flying over there. So Zoom helped us enter spaces that were created only because of COVID. You know, we had a whole bunch of poets who had uh, always invited international poets and that would take time and logistics but now i was able to enter spaces uh, with my poetry i was surprised that people were affected by it it was uh, complete I'm completely amazed that people across the world could uh, react to some of the things i was writing so uh, yeah so uh, my answer would be, yeah, 
people in UK and Australia and Ireland, in Japan, in India, all love poetry, all have a universal language that everybody can understand, appreciate all the metaphors and similes are things people can uh, comprehend and accept and, and love and uh, uh, get emotional about. So I found that interesting and, and, and uh, suddenly during COVID when we all were undergoing this isolation, I felt connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, now you talk about observing things from a different vantage point depending upon where in the world we are located. When you, I know you're also uh, coming to poetry as a mixed race person, uh, you're coming to poetry as a, a husband and a father and uh, of adult children, and, and you're also coming to poetry as a contrarian. So many different things influence your works. Is there something in particular that, that is a signature trait of Julian Matthews. I think uh, one of the things I try to do is I try to be performative. So I'm not a page poet. Yeah, I'm only learning that now. I'm only learning forms now. It was always free verse. It was just me writing lines and hoping they sound good together. So, uh, yeah, so... Uh, I try to incorporate some humor, some puns in it, mainly because uh, I get to play around with language like I never did when I was a journalist. Yeah, you have uh, house styles in, in journalism. You have to follow those house styles very strictly. You have an intro, you have a headline. You have to have enough content in there that's factual, that's accurate. Whereas with poetry, I, I was completely open to anything. <laughs> and I found that freedom so wonderful because I could play around with words and I appreciate words. I appreciate language. I was a reader when I was a teenager. So that made it writing poetry so fun. And when I performed it, I was surprised that people got it. I was so surprised that people appreciated it. And that kept me going. So some of the places I'd gone to in Zoom expected me to produce teams. They had teams every week. So that was a challenge for me. And I tried to be the contrarian there. I tried to uh, come up with something that was slightly left of center of the team, but still could... Uh, fit the team and uh, that's the way I've been doing it for the past mm, now six years yeah uh, more active in the last three years yeah. gotcha gotcha now certainly your 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 previous uh, life as a journalist had to influence your even your poetry so they you're, you're you're aware of the uh the guidelines of technical writing and to the freedom that poetry affords is something that uh, I hear you saying you, you had fun with and, and that uh, allows your audience to have fun in, in hearing those pre pieces that you present. If, if you're doing a serious poem, will, do you find that you fall back towards your journalist background or do you still not try to uh, be as, as factual in, in that? Tell us, how does your profession, uh, your previous profession, affect your poetry today? Well, first thing, when I'm writing about something serious, I try to stick to the facts. I try not to go, uh, uh, to get too emotional about it. Second thing is, uh, what I learned from journalism is, you need a good intro. I notice a lot of poetry does not capture the person within the first line. They're sort of building up. And one of the great lessons I got from the workshop was if the first stanza doesn't work, throw it out. <laughs> Get to the second one <laughs> where the action really is. And that I learned from journalism. Another thing I noticed is a lot of new poets don't have titles. And it's easy as a journalist for me to come up with titles. I already sometimes have the title in my head and that's, that triggers the whole poem. That's another thing. 
the other thing is uh, I, from journalism is leave them hanging right at the end you want to have a follow up right so you you indicate something at the end that is usually lands the poem and uh, gets you uh, to someone's heart uh, yeah okay well certainly that that lesson of doing away with an early stanza is something that some of us learned late in poetry, but it's such a valid point. Oh my goodness, yes. When we come to realize that that really might have gotten us started on the poem, but it does not lend to the message overall. So that's a very important message that some poets are still struggling to grasp. Let's see, I want to get a, a little bit of what advice would you give upcoming poets? And, and I know you say that you're relatively new to poetry, but because of your expertise as a writer, but just what what advice would you give to upcoming poets? I think if you're... One minute or less, because we're going to transition to your poetry here. Okay. I think it'd be great if you just try out some Zoom open mics because you're in the comforts of your room. Mm -hmm. You have the poem in front of you. You don't have to memorize it. And thirdly, you can just leave. <laughs> if the room gets too intense and the poetry gets too intense and you don't want to read, you can just indicate that you're not ready and you can just leave. You can't do that in an open mic when you're in front of everybody <laughs> in person. Very true. Very true. Well, that's, yeah, take the pressure off. Absolutely. Zoom allows you to take the pressure off. Well, I definitely agree with that as being a wholehearted good point for the beginners. And we want people to enjoy and not feel pressed by poetry. So, Julian, it is now time for our guest to, for our viewers to get to experience some of your poetry. So, Ladies and gentlemen, sit back and hold on because we have a wonderful poet with us who is now going to share from, from his heart, from his mind, all those things that a journalist and a poet, uh, well, just someone who is a worldly person based on their experiences that uh, I've uh, witnessed on Zoom because I've only met him on Zoom. I'm very thankful for that. So, Julian, the mic is all yours. Thank you. The first poem is called uh, Shadow. I wonder where shadows go when people die. Do they ascend like souls to heaven and wait their turn to be sent down again? To loyally follow a new owner around like a lolling puppy? A life of service without so much as a petting or a bone, growing by the crouching under the cover of feet at midday, shedding its thin cloak by late afternoon and just retiring until the next day, unless the owner is nocturnal, aroused under street lights, frequents low-lit bars, and it makes a walk-on guest appearance on tenement walls, grungy alleyways, bouncing across the room like a bendy acrobat, cast by a bedside lamp, just in time to steal the show. Shadows, after all, have their own allure. They are aesthetic, so cinematic. Until the last candle on the altar is put out and they descend into the abyss, that starless realm where all good shadows eventually go to take their bow. The second poem is written just last year when I was invited to come back to the remembrance of for the victims of MH370, we lost 239 people from around the world in that plane. And parts of the plane started showing up in the African coast, in Madagascar, the island of Madagascar, and other islands around there. And the plane uh, lasted by this year has now been gone for nine years. And there has been no closure in terms of finding any parts of the body of the plane or the, the, the victims of the plane. And uh, I was just um, 
one or two degrees separated from at least four victims on that plane. I had uh, two friends who were stewardesses on the on Malaysian Airlines who knew people who were on Malaysian Airlines working that day on that particular plane. I had uh, my wife uh, lost a colleague, the, the, the one and only American who was on that plane. So I felt for all the victims and I, I wrote this. It's called Hope. Hope is the cold metal hanger in my heart where I hang the coat of all my warm memories of you, which I put on to feel your hug, your firm arms around me. Hope is the candle I light and relight in my mind, remind, remembering all the ways you glowed, all the ways we melted into each other. I keep the flame lit so I can still feel the burning longing for you to come home, to see grace in these shadows. Hope is the light I leave on all night, every night, awaiting your return. Hope is a kite on the high wind I hold on to this hold on to this unfurling string, unwilling to let go even as you get smaller and smaller in the distance, in the blue sky. I shade my eyes as you merge in the lap of the light. Hope is stubbornly willing this line between us to never, ever snap. Hope is the ship you last boarded waiting, waving your goodbyes from the handrails. Hope is me waving right back at you, port side, my arm hurting as it gets heavier and heavier, and you further and further with the passage of time. Hope is your silhouette on the horizon, bobbing on this sea of heartache. Hope is the salty tears I cry on nights like these that could fill the ocean between us. Hope is this piece of the broken plane I found on the beach that you may have brushed against lightly as you walk down the aisle, this drifted debris I hold in my trembling hands. Hope is placing my ear against it, cheek against shard, to listen to your last message within. I dreamt again of you last night. Like the thousand dreams before you, grin cheekily, your eyes smiling as you stepped through the front door. I asked you, nay, demanded, where have you been? And you reached out, pressed your palm against my chest, my honeycombed heart, and replied calmly, sweetly, Here, always here, my love. Hope is knowing that it's true. Hope is awakening to that truth. Hope is the only home I know. The third poem is called uh, Other or Line Line. So I'm partly Sri Lankan and partly Chinese on my mother's side, but she was adopted by an Indian family. So in Malaysia, we're a multi-ethnic country, but usually in government forms under race, there are only four boxes. The first one is Malay. The second one is Chinese, the two majority races. The third is Indian. And the last is other, or in Malay, Lain Lain. So Lain Lain is spelled L-A-I-N, L-A-I-N. And uh, it's important to uh, know this word as I I go on in the poem. As a schoolboy, I was always asked what mix I was, as if I were ingredients to make a cake by, as if I were eggs that needed to be separated into yellows and whites. For better or worse, then I would say I'm half-baked or stengah masa, like the two half-boiled eggs my anglophile Holy Ceylonese father ate ritually every morning, made faithfully by his Chinese-born Indian adopted wife and served with white salt, black pepper, and brown toes. White, yellow, brown, or black. Color, mix, race, boxes to tick. Why didn't we have more choices like the Luna 12 color pencil boxes we had or the 64 color boxes that my rich friends had that I so envied? Because I was told I was not Malay, Chinese, nor Indian. And even though the teacher insisted Ceylonese should be classified under Indian, 
I refused to play the game. And why was my mother's composition not in the equation? When it comes to race, Chegu, jangan main main, teacher. Don't play play. I would rather be tagged lain lain. Not as a badge of shame, but to show that under this prick skin we are same same. After all, isn't lain lain just an anagram for nail nail, like the two in the cross? I'd rather be a martyr than for all those who are lost. And if they crucified me for it, maybe it would start a religion that a billion others profess to. And the lying, lying gospels would not be written only by four men. It would have a billion godless spells written by every man, woman, and every gender in between. Every page, verse, and chapter would not be just in black ink on white paper, but a psychedelic rainbow reflecting nothing anyone has ever heard or seen before. We all are from the same DNA. So why do you label me as another? Do our mothers and fathers deserve to be called others? I could call you sister or brother or any pronoun you wish to be. You see, it really doesn't matter to me. I only see what I see. Do you see me too? So tell me again, what color are your fears? What race are your tears? What religion is your blood? What language are your hopes? What ancestry, breeding, caste, descent, extraction, pedigree, parentage, background, status do I have to be to call you my friend? And what will it take for you to identify me as human? Because when they made Lion Lion, they didn't just break the mold. They broke the yolk and mixed in white salt and black pepper and dipped brown toast in it. And it was whole, meal, fully organic, naturally delicious. Take it or leaven it. We may decline to be defined by tiny boxes to tick on, and we may pay the price because we don't conform, but at least we know we are our own. Yes, I am the other. We are all others. Instead of other, can you just reach out? Shake my hand and call me brother. Oh my gosh, Julian, Julian, I am just filled. I am filled. I, I, you are such an incredible poet. I mean, poignant, mesmerizing even. You, you make us feel, you make us think, you make us cry in our soul. It's, I love your poetry. I am so, so honored that you accepted the invitation to be a guest on Sojourn with Words. I know our viewers felt exactly what I felt, and you bring it so beautifully. Thank you so much. Let, let our viewers know, how can they be in touch with you if they want to know about what you're doing, what Zooms you're on, or what upcoming publications they might be able to catch? Thank you. Uh, you can catch me on Linktree slash Julian Matthews. Linktree is spelled L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Julian Matthews. Julian Matthews is one word spelt with double T and an S. Okay. Okay. Well, I know that uh, I have enjoyed having you as a guest poet. We, we know that our viewers are probably still reeling from uh, the powerful and poignant poems that you shared. And and uh, viewers, I'm sure you'll understand now why when I said uh, he's a word master, he truly mesmerizes the audiences, leaves us spellbound. And I am just thrilled. I'll, I'll, I don't babble often on Sojourn with Words, but that's where I feel I am right now. But for those that are with us today, our guest uh, poet is Julian Matthews. Of course, I'm your host, Sister Joy, right here on CTV out of Prince George's County, Maryland, stateside here in the United States. And Julian Matthews is from Malaysia. So, Julian, thank you so very much for sharing your, your exquisite poetry. And for those that want to be in touch, definitely let me know. I'll be happy to pass words on to him. But your email information and all of that, 
will appear as Cairo generated on your screen shortly. So thank you, Julian. And for those that are Sojourn with Words family, I think you'll agree. Once again, Sojourn with Words presents the best. So for those that are tempted to pick up a pen and remember that note of encouragement from Julian. Sometimes we start a poem with a stanza, but that's just to get the pen flowing. We might want to discard that first stanza, but it's up to you, but you don't always have to keep it. And I like that because that has happened to me more than once. So Julian, again, thank you. I'm Sister Joy here on CTV in Prince George's County, Maryland, United States of America. And we want everyone to know that whenever you feel the urge, pick up a pen and keep writing.